great opportunity to celebrate together for the 130th uh, birthday of this church. Uh, to come together at a time that uh, there are a lot of memories and a lot of history, obviously. Uh, gener this is a generational church. Um, as uh, Cassandra said in the video, the, she's a lifer uh, here. So there are people who've been here uh, all their lives, or almost all of their lives. And so it's a wonderful thing uh, to celebrate that. Uh, it, ironically, interestingly for me, the years this church was just getting started, 1892, 1893, are the birth years of my paternal grandparents. And so, so when you talk about, we talk about those years, and I'm thinking about what was going on for them uh, in, in their world. So uh, I feel a sense of connection to uh, the origin of this church. Uh, so it's a, great, it's a great thing. It's been a packed service. We've had uh, Virginia, Bob Rice put together the, uh, the videos. Thanks to everybody who made this service uh, what it is. And so now I stand up to preach, and I, and I, I think you'll have time to get home for the Cardinals game. As long as you can get home by one o'clock, you're okay. So <laughs> we're okay. <laughs> no, maybe not that long. So, um, so you know, uh, I think as a culture, as a society, you know, I've talked before about cultural norms, uh, social norms, uh, those things that kind of just the way things are. I think as a as a culture, as a society in general, we don't like people who are arrogant. Right, people who are cocky, full of themselves, think they're all that. We don't, we don't. We're kind of like, eh, don't, we don't like that. Uh, not, not the vibe we we want to experience. Uh, and so w we just we don't like that. People who are self promoters, talking about how great they are, right, all that kind of thing. And yet, some of these are people who uh, are the most followed on social media. These are the people who sell the most books. These are the people who people pay to go hear them speak or do whatever it is they do. That's right. It's, and so it's this weird kind of thing. And then we elect them into public office. Yeah, you can chuckle at that. That's funny. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to, yeah. Uh, and so these are, these are folks that, that we, 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 we kind of love to hate, right? We, we don't like the arrogance. On the other hand, we promote them. We talk about them. We follow them. We, it's, it's weird kind of mixed message. So it, I think what we'd love is to say to people, we, we want you to be a world changer. Sure, be a world changer, but be really humble about it. Just be really humble. Now, there are a handful of people who can pull that off, right? There are a handful of people who can pull that off. I mean, whether, you, whether or not you like this politics, uh, not everybody is a Jimmy Carter. I mean, who has done some really significant, wonderful, world-changing things, and, and is a very humble person. Not everybody is that person. So when you read the scripture passage uh, that Bill read a little bit ago, especially the way it started, um, it, it, it's a scripture passage that I've heard people through the years say, one of the reasons they don't like what Paul writes in the New Testament, some people have several reasons they don't like what he writes in the New Testament, but one of the ones that gets pointed to is this passage, because he's so arrogant. Can't believe he's so arrogant. So... Um, I've said before, you know, we read a scripture passage and we, don't, we, we may not like it, it kind of troubles us. We don't have to be afraid of it, we just need to look at it and figure out what it's really trying to say. And so uh, when we look at what Paul says, I mean, he's, he does start off in a way that in our world sounds pretty, yeah, pretty arrogant. When he starts off saying, uh, for those of you who think you have reason to brag, I have more. Well, good grief. I mean, it's kind of off-putting to start with, right? And so in our, in our world, that would, that would sound off-putting. That would sound arrogant, cocky. Uh, we have to remember in the ancient world, um, things were different. Uh, these people uh, did not have social media. Uh, these people did not have their faces and names plastered on the side of a city bus. Um, and so these, these tra especially the traveling preachers, philosophers, prophets, go into a place to speak. They, start, they find a place, a public place, and they start speaking. Well, people don't know who they are, so they always list their credentials. One of the things they would do up front, this was common in the ancient world, was for them to come in and say, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've done this, I've done this, I'm from these people, this is what I've... So that people kind of, it's kind of like establishing, this is my resume, right? Here's my credentials, why you should listen to me, why I have something to say. So in Paul's world, this would have been normal. This would have been normal to have heard that. Oh, okay, okay. Well, now we know a little bit more about the guy. He lists seven things as his accomplishments, achievements, things that, that promote him to be a, someone you should listen to. But then he says something interesting, and so that's why you always have to keep reading. 
right? What, 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 what is that, where's this going? Because he says, but all of those things, all of the achievements, the things I could list on my resume, the things that people would point to and say, wow, look at that. That's really impressive. I consider that, he says, a loss. Think of it as gains and losses. What are the things you gain, things you lose, right? I, can, I consider it loss compared to the value of the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus. He's not saying those are insignificant. He's not saying they're bad. He's not saying throw them away. He's just saying compared to the knowledge of Christ, it, just, it, it can't compare. It can't compare. He says it, it's, it, he considers that a loss. A little bit further down, he, he, can, he calls it rubbish. Now, now, that word rubbish is a translator's choice of word. It's a translator's choice. Because the word uh, would be more closely connected to... Uh, an earthy term, uh, let me see if I can be a little delicate, uh, dung. That's more what it's connected to. So, so, in, so, so that would have been a pretty bold statement, right? I consider all that I've done as dung compared to the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus and the power of his resurrection. So he's really not promoting himself. He's saying all these things, pff, in the long run, they're, yeah, they're, they're significant in one way, but they don't compare at all. So his goal is no longer to achieve these things. His goal is something different. His goal, he says, is to obtain the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now that sounds like he's now striving for something else. He's trying to achieve something else. And he says, I can't lay hold of it. But he's saying he's willing. He's willing to experience the, the power of the resurrection. He's willing to be a willing participant in the work of God in the world. He's willing to do those things so that he can be an instrument of God's grace and God's peace in the world. So he writes this to a church in the midst of the Roman Empire. Anytime we read the New Testament, you've got to remember this is in the Roman Empire. It's in the Roman Empire. That's the context. It's not just some people somewhere. It's in the Roman Empire. And everything has some kind of, of uh, reaction to or message regarding the context of the Roman Empire. So, um, so these are people who live in a place where there's a lot of self-promotion, where there's a lot of power, where there's a lot of wealth concentrated in very small numbers of people. This is a place where people self-promote. This is a place where people seek to gain advantage over one another. This is the culture there. That's the, co the social norm. And so Paul is trying to say that all of those kinds of achievements, they really don't count. But to focus on the power of the resurrection of Christ. And, and in so doing, be willing to do what God intends, what God wants in our lives and in the world. So, these are wealthy, powerful people in the Roman Empire, and their culture honors power and might. So he's trying to encourage them. He's trying to encourage them to be something different, to be something different than simply uh, trying to fit into the culture, because there are times that churches just take on, begin to take on the characteristics of the culture, and he's saying, yeah, nope, <laughs> set that aside. Focus on the power of the resurrection of Christ. So for Paul, whatever achievements, whatever accolades, they matter little. He encourages them to press on, to press on. In, in this culture of, of power and chaos, press on. Keep doing the right thing. Keep taking the high road. Keep following Christ. Keep uh, working toward experiencing the power of the resurrection so that you can be that power and that grace and that love for others. One of the commentators that I read uh, said that Paul, in his work with the churches in the, in the Mediterranean area uh, during that time, it's like he was trying to help them to become islands of devotion. I love that notion. That in this sea of the Roman Empire's power and chaos, <laughs> that there are places 
There are these places that emerge out of that sea that are places of peace and places of joy. Places where, where, where they don't try to distinguish between people. They don't say some people are better than others and we're going to somehow designate who fits and who doesn't. No, no. They are all loved and we're all in this together. That kind of island. So, First United Methodist Church has been an island of devotion for 130 years. We, we've been a place where people can come and be a part of, to find community. I've heard these words, right? We've heard these words. Community, acceptance, love, uh, meaning, purpose. These are all things that this, this has been an island of, of devotion. And, and, and that's significant to do that for, for uh, 30 year, 100, 130 years. You, you may or may not know this. Uh, church, churches are struggling these days. Churches are struggling, right? Um, six to 10,000 churches will close in the next year. When someone starts a new church and they say, we're ready to start a new church, they, all right, we're going to get going. And they do all the things, they do all the prep work, they do all their uh, uh, due diligence, they do everything they need to do. They get the people and on board and they get going and they start a church. Over two-thirds of those churches will close within five years. Now, I know this church was established at a different time in a different era and it was a different world in a lot of ways. It's still significant. <laughs> it's still significant to have the ministry here that we press on. Even when there's difficulties and times get rough, we press on. Even when we sometimes face things as a congregation that we think, oh, we don't know how in the world we're going to face this, we press on. Not, not just to say, look how great we are, but to press on to make a difference in the world, to press on saying we, we seek that the power of the resurrection of Christ. We seek to be that island of devotion in a sea of power and chaos. We'll press on. It's what we do. Press on. <laughs>